Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, GitHub tutorial. Uh, I'm Karen O'Donoghue. I'm with the uh, IETF education team. Uh, I'd like to... Um, seems a bit echoey, doesn't it? Oh, you can't hear me. Now you can hear me. <laughs> okay. Folks in the back, can you hear me? A bit better. Oh, so I just need to be louder. Okay. So we can cut this part out of the video. Anyway, um, I'm Karen O'Donoghue with the IETF education team. I'd like to welcome you uh, to the uh, tutorial. Uh, I'd also like, there's going to be a survey link in there. I'd, I'd really appreciate any survey results that you have, um, any, any thoughts you have on the tutorial itself, additional tutorials that could possibly be offered. Uh, and the other thing is the, I, the uh, edu team is actually looking for um, additional help and additional resources. So if you are willing to a, help provide any tutorials, or B, help shepherd other tutorials, or do other work associated with uh, the IETF, like uh, helping organize the IETF education materials on the website or on the wiki. Uh, there's just a long list of opportunities, and we would love to have you. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Bishop, and he'll be talking to you about the GitHub. All right, so... if. The Oh, yes. All right. Is that better? All right. Just have to eat the mic. Um, so my name is Mike Bishop. Uh, hopefully the closed captions are not too distracting and might be helpful for someone. Um, and if it mistranscribes anything like my name, we can laugh at it. Um, we're talking about the tools that are available for using Markdown and GitHub to keep track of your internet drafts. So we'll be looking at basic concepts. Yep. We'll be looking at basic concepts around Markdown, Git, the template, and how you use GitHub and CI systems to tie all those together. I'm not going to go into as much detail on the Markdown because Dan already did a session on that in the previous time slot. But if I can just get a show of hands, how many people are already using Markdown to write their drafts? Fair number. Um, and who's familiar with Git, whether in an ID context or not? Most people. I will skim that section very quickly then. Uh, and do you use GitHub already for things? Similar number. OK. So we'll focus mostly on how to get things set up and not as much on the tools themselves, but I will still take a quick look around how the different working groups are using things. So things we're not focusing on, the XML RFC V3, not diving into that very much. There's an excellent talk about that previous time slot, um, but most of this is gonna output V2 for the time being, and you're also shielded from the exact version of the output. I don't want to get into the details of whether working groups should use GitHub. There's a working group later this week on the best practices if they're going to. And you know the pronunciation of the BOF that did not intend to form a working group and did. <laughs> Let's leave that alone. So I think the best tagline for using Markdown, it is certainly less cryptic than XML. It's intended to be something that somebody can read through and it's easily consumable in the base text format. But then we have tools that can take that text format and spit out nice, easy to work with HTML that's convenient for reading and the text format that we all know and perhaps love. The front matter helps generate all the boilerplate and this is the same thing that you would find at the beginning of an XML document produced XML to RFC. Basically, grab somebody else's document and adapt accordingly. I would not try and know what all the different things are that you have to put up here to have a beginning document. There are a couple different ways that you can do references. Um, this was alluded to in the previous session. You can be very explicit and write it out yourself. And this is YAML. Um, as one comment noted, you have to get the spacing exactly right if you're going to do it that way. But each document has a normative and an informative section at the beginning. Or you can explicitly list out the documents and just let it pull from the database of all the RFCs, all the internet drafts. Yes, go ahead.
What was that? Okay. So, uh, I really don't have a good way to adjust the lighting, but the slides are posted online. And yes. So the comment was that it, it is hard to read some of the text that's up there, um, probably because the lights are shining on the screen. So you can take the, you can put the number of the RFC and just let it pull in and populate that from the online database. Or what you can do is just do the inline references and not even mention anything up front, but when you need to make a reference to a document, then you just put the two curly braces with normative or informative, exclamation mark for a normative, question mark for an informative reference. The other nice thing about that is that you can give a different name to that reference. So if I wanna call RFC 7540 HTTP2 instead of always referencing by number. I think that makes for a nicer output. And all of these th things are supported by the XML, but you can use cram down and the markdown formats to lead into it. So just skimming through here, within the middle and the back sections, you use the, the hashes to do level, well, top level, second level, third level headings. If you go past third level, you can get really deep, but anything below third level doesn't show in the table of contents. You can do cross-references either to sections um, or figures by putting the anchor tag. So you just indicate the anchor that was provided with the section, and if there isn't one that's put um, when the section was declared, then it just takes the title and it converts that. So you can see the, the third level heading. I didn't give it an anchor tag and it just takes the text of the title. Drawings and tables, again, I would suggest grab an example document and the ones from Quick are a good instance of that. But all of those are supported by cram down and the markdown format and will turn into nice tables both in the HTML and in the text output. As far as Git, looks like most people are familiar with it, so let's just skip through there. We have commits that are snapshots at different points, branches and tags, let's skip through that. So the idea is we have these tools that let you start with Markdown and use Cramdown or MMark or some other options to turn into XML, and then you can take XML to RFC that can give you the HTML output, the text output, you can use PostScript to turn text into PDF. And those are all great as standalone tools that you can use. But when you want to tie them together, um, there's a tool called the ID template that you can get from GitHub that just wraps them all up and uses a Git repo and fundamentally the ID template is the hideously complex set of make files that tie all of this together and let you take a document and have it spit out all the right things. So. I don't know how well I'm going to be able to eat the mic over here. So since there was a question on how well we could see earlier, are you able to see, see that as well? Okay. All right, are you able to see, is the mic on or do I just need to be even closer? Mic's on. Okay. So what we have in this repo is just a markdown file 
that has an existing internet draft in it. So the tools that are there build on make so that if I run make, it's going to go and download all the necessary references and spit out. Now we have the HTML and the text version. So if I go pull that up, so it generates all the boilerplate here that you would want. So if I wanted to go and make a change to this document, let's say I wanted to add some text. I want to add the boilerplate from RFC 6919 to define the terms must but we know you won't, should consider, all of those other terms that we aren't officially supposed to use but use all the time. And then I will do so I'll try and commit that. And it's going to tell me that I actually made a reference to 69.19.99, and it will refuse to let me commit it because I'm making a reference to an RFC that doesn't exist. So one nice feature here is that it will actually sanity check the document when you try and commit it. So I'll fix that and go back. And now if I commit it, it's in the repo, it's there. And so that, that lets you get different outputs. Um, and you have the check before you go in. Other things that you can do just from the local repo, if I tell it make diff, then if I had RFC diff installed, sorry, um, then it would build the output of the comparison from the last time the draft was submitted to the current state of the repo. And if you're trying to run everything locally, make submit, it says it doesn't need to. Okay, well, apparently we didn't make enough sacrifices for demo gods. What make submit does is it builds the um, XML and the text versions that you would need to upload to the data tracker when you are ready to submit the document. So, looking at GitHub, people are probably familiar with what, what GitHub offers. Um, it's essentially a hosted Git repository and then a set of workflow tools. So the way the quick working group has been using that the re um, we have a readme file that lists all the documents and this is actually auto generated by the ID template that for each document you get a link to the editor's copy which is a live reflection of what is currently in the repo. We use the issue tracker. We use pull requests to, um, we use pull requests to manage text that people would like to bring into the documents who are not the editors. So the way we have it set up, the editors are the ones who have write access and then anybody else can clone the repo and propose changes. So if I wanted to go in and take a change, um, I'm actually not going to go into how to use GitHub because most people said they were familiar with that. But the process when you start hooking GitHub in along with CircleCI, that's when you get 
really nice automation around all of these things. So you have your local copy of the ID template and you're making edits and each time you can build it, it'll do a sanity check and produce the local HTML and text that you're interested in. When you're ready to push that to GitHub, fine, other people can see the, the markdown changes that you've made. But GitHub enables uh, change triggers. So external tools can observe when something changes in the repository. And so if you set up a trigger with CircleCI or Travis, which are both supported CI mechanisms, then you can have them run their own container with a copy of the ID template. And what they will build, they'll take the documents, push it back to the GH Pages branch, and that's how you get that editor's copy. Where anybody with a web browser can go and see those documents. So what that actually builds, uh, if we go back to the So the GH pages gets published um, on github.io and the name of the repo. Now Quick actually has it set up to redirect to a particular domain name, but that the generic form is your GitHub username dot github and .io slash repo name. And the ID template will build for the master branch at the top, and then for every branch, it will show you all the built documents of the current state of that branch. The other thing that can happen on CI is that it can respond to tags in the repo. So if you tag a particular document as being dra uh, draft version 00, 01, whatever your next version is, then it will actually take the document once it's built and it can upload it to the data track app. Sorry. And it can upload it to the data tracker. And so your actual workflow when you're ready to submit your document is simply build it, tag it, and push the tags and then you get the email that asks whether you, in fact, were the one who submitted that document and if you want to approve it for publication. So this can help take out a lot of your interaction with the data tracker and just get the publication directly from the command line where you're already working on the document. So when you're trying to set up a repo from scratch, a lot of this is really convenient once you get it running but the difficult piece is getting bootstrapped. Trying to take an empty repo and get it set up. The, the ID template setup script is quite good about telling you when you haven't done something correctly. Um, but when I was getting started with it, I will, would often just do a loop of run setup. It'll tell me, oh, you haven't done this yet. And then I need to go fix it, uh, fix it. Um, there are some setup scripts that Rich Sauls has written that are intended to help, help you get the repo set up in the first place. So it will create an account on GitHub for a working group and it will let a working group or an individual with an existing uh, account set up a new repo. But it still comes out as an empty repo. You can upload a uh, upload a template to it. So what I'm going to do now is just walk through taking <coughs> taking an empty GitHub repo and you can either use the script to create it uh, you can use the script to create it or you can do it directly on GitHub. So I'm going to say I want a new repository and Sure, fantastic journey. I'll just take the name that it offers. So right now we have an empty repository. And then I'm going to come to the command line and do the basic setup. So the first thing you do is clone it down.
And before anything else happens, you need to put a very basic version of the draft. So Rich's script would populate this with a, with a template that has no content. For purposes of this, um, this demo, I'm going to copy the change that we did from the DNS alt service draft. So, so the setup is first you have to have already committed and pushed. So git push just interacts with the remote repository to, yes. Just a question. Um, is the fantastic journey the working group? Uh, in this case, it's just the repository for the document. So one of the things that we'll be discussing in the Git working group for pr and best practices is whether you should have a single repo for all the documents, like we've mostly done with Quick, or whether it's better to have individual repos per document. I have mostly done one large repo, but uh, I know the TLS working group has a separate uh, repository per document, and either one works. Uh, functionally, it's equivalent. The template can handle having multiple drafts present, so it will build each draft that it finds. So I've pushed that, and then if we're going to set up the template, So the ID template itself is on GitHub. It's under Martin Thompson's account, and the URL is in the slides. So you clone it down into a directory <laughs> called lib, and it contains the setup script. So you run make and point it to that setup location. And then what the template is going to do is First, check that your draft actually is present and builds and has already been pushed up to GitHub. So it wants to make sure you have a, a good link. And then it will start populating a readme file that contains the name of your draft and tells people what working group it's affiliated with, tells them the discussion should happen on the, reading, on the mailing list. It populates a contributing a contributing document that points them to the note well and just helps to solve the issue of how do people who do drive-by contributions on GitHub know that they need to comply with the note well and the IPR policies of that. And it helps populate the things that you need in the repo So at the end of that setup, if we look at the commits, we see that the setup script added a new commit that creates all these files. And it added a GH pages branch, which is where the built documents created by the change uh, by the CI, the continuous integration, are going to live. But if we go back to our GitHub repo, all of this lives. If we look at the GH pages branch, what we'll actually find is even though the index.html file is there, it's empty. So that relies on getting things set up in the change, uh, continuous integration system. So once you've created the repository, you need to go to Circle CI and tell it that it should actually be building from that repo. So you tell it to add project, and you find your new repo. And it'll try to walk you through creating the .circleci config.yaml. 
That's actually already added by the template. So when you run the setup script that's created for you, you can just say start building. So at that point, oh, build error, lovely. Oh, I know what I missed. It created the it created the commit on my local repo, but I never pushed that to GitHub. So if I come back here, now that I've pushed it, you'll find then you'll see that it's populated the README file with the name of the draft, the links to the, where the editor's copy is going to be. The contributing guidelines will show up here for anyone who is interested. So now we should be able to see, yes, it, it does run. And so what this is going to do is every time you push to the repo, it will build the documents. And if the documents don't build correctly, then Circle will send you an email. So that is a convenient way to keep uh, keep track, particularly if you have lots of people collaborating on a working group repo, that if somebody breaks the build, you find out about it. So let's say, well, before we get to that, there is one thing that's still missing, though. So if we go to the GH pages, it doesn't actually push back because Circle needs permission to do that. So when you're going to set that up, you need to go into GitHub settings. And they hide it under developer settings to get the access tokens. And an access token is something that is not your password that can be used to talk to GitHub on your behalf. So you'll create one with whatever permissions you want. The only permission that it requires, the only permission that's required for the CI system is public repos, so long as it's not actually hidden. And you take that change token and you'll come to, come over to circle. So then in the settings for each project, that goes in as an environment variable. Now, since I already have it set up, I will go to a different repo and copy it over. The name of the name of the variable is GH token, and you paste in the token that you got from GitHub. The other the other place where those tokens are useful is you'll need them at the command line to interact with GitHub if you have two-factor auth set up with your main account. You can create a token using two-factor auth and then use that token as the password for a tool that can't interact with the two-factor uh, two flow. So now that the token is there, anytime I have a build from here on out, and I'm just going to restart the same build with the version of the draft. It will not only build the documents. Okay, it's cloning. So now it's going to push it back. So if you look at the commit history, first thing it's going to show you is with each commit, when CI tries to build it, even if it doesn't have the token, it will report back to GitHub whether that version in that commit was able to build successfully. 
So you can easily see this one it wasn't able to build. Then we pushed it after setting up the ID template and you get the green check mark. And every time you introduce a commit, it's going to add a new commit to the GH Pages branch with that version of the built documents committed by the ID bot. And this is what gives you, let me now do, we go over here, and now it has built the index page with the HTML version and the text version. And when you're ready to submit, you do an annotated tag of, I don't even remember what, what version of the draft this is actually on, but I'm not gonna let the submission go through anyway. One thing to note is that in order for Circle to do this and do the auto submission to the data tracker, it has to be an annotated tag, which means you have to give it a message to go with the tag, but the actual content of that message doesn't matter at all. So you have to pass something. It will fail if you don't, or rather it will bring up the editor and ask you to type it. So if I create the tag, and now I push the tags up to GitHub. We go and take another look in circle. You'll see that that tag is also something that it will build on. And the last step when it finishes the build is that it's going to use curl to upload it to the data tracker, which will generate an email to all the listed authors. And I've already told Ben that he should not respond to any emails from the data tracker about this draft today. And I'm going to cancel the submission when I get the email. That assumes that I guessed right on the draft version that, uh, and the data tracker doesn't reject it for me. So the last step is part of the build process. You can see the upload to data tracker. And it's looking for a 200 OK coming back. And if it doesn't get a success on the submission, then what it will do is email me that the build failed on that tag to say it couldn't, it couldn't submit to the data tracker. You may need to do that manually. So to recap how we do that setup, first you need all the local tools. Um, you have to have git and make for the template to work. XML to RFC depends on Python. Frame down RFC 2629 requires Ruby. And those can be installed with their appropriate handlers. Actually, um, APT is able to take all of these directly. So if you just go and ask for those four. Um, you can get more current versions of XML to RFC um, off of the PyPy installer and cram down can come off of Ruby gems. On the cloud side, you need to create your repo either with the script or manually. Uh, and you need access tokens to give to Circle. And then on Circle, you need to set it up to follow the repo and you need to have the access token in the environment variables if you want it to actually populate back to the repo on your behalf. So, full disclosure, while I have um, made some contributions to the ID template, I'm not the one who wrote it. That would be Martin Thompson. So if this looks like a tool that will make authoring internet graphs easier for you, I would say buy him a drink. I have found it to be a lot simpler than trying to mess with the XML, which I did at the beginning of my time in the IETF. But at this point, I am marked down for basically everything. Mostly for reviewing the slides later, I've got some basic, like what commands you would use in Git for different tasks. And that is the end of what I've written. 
over a lot. And we're way under time because I skimmed through the things that it looked like most people were familiar with. But if there's anything that you want me to go back and go into more detail on, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. And the deafening silence in the room is either okay. Sebastian, go ahead. Uh, hi, Mark. Thanks for the presentation. I was uh, wondering if there's a particular commitment you plan to to um, GitHub versus other platforms such as GitLab or so many others out there. Um, GitHub is what we have primarily used. I believe, I believe that it would work with any remote Git repository so long as it can integrate with Circle, but I don't actually know how reliant Circle is on using GitHub and not the other versions. And then maybe a sort of, you mentioned Circle. I also saw that there's support for Travis. Yes. Is that, is that being deprecated or why is that? Uh, it is still present and supported, but I'm not sure whether the newer features like auto submitting to the data tracker are supported in Travis or not. Okay, thank you. We, um, we have experienced that Circle is more reliable for building things and also it passes more information into the environment of the build that the template is able to pull on. If you open up some of the make file scripts that are part of the template. You can see comments like, if this is Travis, this is not populated, we have to attempt to guess it. Yeah, Rich, Travis might also be on its way in decline because most of the staff has been fired. Oh. I imagine that doesn't help. Actually, on that, on that if I could continue. Yeah, please. Um, the, the reason I ask about GitHub and I, I mentioned GitLab as well is because Git, with GitLab it, it could be self-hosted, mm -hmm. and there wouldn't be a dependency on you know startups going out of business or things like that. I mean, yeah. granted, Microsoft owning GitHub is pretty reassuring, I guess, in the long run. But um, for some of the other tools that are related to it, it might make sense for the ITF tools to also be open source and be, be able to, to be self-hosted by, by authors. Yeah, so a lot of that discussion is likely to happen in the Git working group later this week. Um, their charter is to come up with best practices for Git, uh, Git and GitHub use at the IETF. We're chartered to focus specifically on GitHub, but the question of whether any of the tools need to be self-hosted and managed by the IETF even if there are third-party equivalents, is definitely going to come up. I'll take a look at that. Thank you. Any other questions? OK. Well, I will stick around for a while if anybody wants to ask anything not at the microphone. Otherwise, thank you for coming.